Okay, Alexander, let's do an update as to what's going on in the UK. I was reading that uh, we have various ministers, MPs in the government who are now calling for Liz Truss to take a hike, to get out. Um, it's very prophetic from you. I mean, you're, you're, you're actually getting, you're even getting the timelines pretty much right. So if we see Liz Truss bolt within this week or the next week, then, you know, you've pretty much nailed this, uh, this story. But uh, eventually it looks like she's, she's toast, whether it's this week or in two weeks or three weeks. I mean, yes, she doesn't have much road left, if any. And then Sunak is next. Yep. And, and, and so who, who else was, was Hunt? Jeremy Hunt, who is the who is the new chancellor, and I mean that's an important story because Jeremy Hunt is an adversary of this trust. I mean, Quartet was an ally. Hunt is not an ally of this trust. He is he is hostile to this trust. Now, I think before we proceed, I just want to say something about the Quartet trust mini budget because I mean I'm having a lot of people ask about this, and I want to explain why I object, why I thought that that mini budget was wrong and why I think the markets reacted as they did, because the narrative you're getting, in my opinion, was the wrong one. Now, obviously, it increases the budget deficit. That is true. And that's I'm, I'm not somebody who believes in increasing the budget deficit. But the fundamental problem with the trust quarting mini budget is that it sought to support, in fact, increased demand at a time of high inflation caused in large part by problems with supply. If you have high demand and low supply, you will get inflation. It follows. Now, if you're going to increase demand even more, which is what Truss and Quateng were trying to do, then you're going to get even more inflation. What Truss and Kwarteng were doing is exactly what the Biden administration was trying to do last year. The Biden administration wanted to increase the rate of economic growth. They were talking about turbocharging growth, running the economy hot through higher spending, tax manipulations of the tax system, and all of that. And we predicted on the Duran. The two of us, not people, you know, who have vast masses of, you know, data to hand that, you know, governments are supposed to have. We predicted that would result in inflation, higher inflation, which wouldn't be transitory. And incredibly, that is exactly what Kwarteng and Trust tried to do in Britain. They wanted to increase economic growth by taking measures very like those that Joe Biden would have done, did last year, and that also would have resulted in an increase in inflation. Now, what makes it even more bizarre is that all those people who last year were supporting Joe Biden and what he was doing, including Joe Biden himself, are now criticising Quateng and Trust for what they've just tried to do, even including Joe Biden himself. He's actually come out and made statements about how this is all a huge mistake, completely oblivious to the fact that Truss and Quateng were doing, in effect, the same thing that he tried to do last year. So I just wanted to clarify that because I think there's been you know, a great deal of obfuscation about this. People are, are being told things about this budget, mini budget, that were wrong. And, of course, the, the markets understood what the problems were, and that was why they reacted negatively. Increasing demand when there is limited supply at a time of high inflation is simply going to result in more inflation. The markets figured that out, and they didn't like it. Now, coming back to the events in Britain, what was going to happen was that on the 31st of October, Quateng was going to come and provide a financial statement. He was going to try and balance the books. He was going to tell us how he was going to pay for these tax cuts that he was going to, going to undertake. He was going to um, 
try and tell us how he was going to think, get things back in some sort of order. That was supposed to happen on the 31st of October. The Bank of England, the governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, made sure that Kwarteng would not be able to do that because Bailey intervened directly in the markets. He made this announcement last week at the beginning of last week and said that the Bank of England would stop its bond buying program by Friday of last week, at the end of last week, and that all pension funds only had up to then to bail out. So, of course, what he was doing was that he was creating a financial crisis which would affect the pensions industry, and he was clearly manoeuvring, and he was doing it with the support of the entire apparatus of Britain's permanent government, you know, club land in, you know, parts of the West End, the British establishment, some Conservative MPs, the Remainers, the, Ma- the, the civil service, Mandarins, the deep state class. They were all working together to try to get Kwarteng out. And they got him out. And of course, from that moment on, you can see that Liz Truss herself is on the run. Exactly as we said, we predicted it, as you correctly said, we, 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 we got it right. The moment Liz Truss parted with Kwarteng, she was forced to bring in Jeremy Hunt as Chancellor. This was not her choice. She would not have wanted Jeremy Hunt. In fact, the word out was that she wanted Saeed Javid. But she didn't get Saeed Javid, who's, you know, closer to her thinking than uh, Jeremy Hunt was. Jeremy Hunt, former... I believe I believe he was a former civil servant. He's been foreign secretary, arch remainer, opponent of Boris Johnson. He ran as the person who was going to support a soft Brexit against Boris Johnson in the leadership election in 2019. He also ran against Liz Truss for the recent leadership election. Again, basically, you know, as a standard bearer for the soft remainers within the Conservative Party. He is absolutely a figure from that sort of permanent state. So he's been forced on Liz Truss. He's now announced massive changes to the entire government economic policy. He's essentially reversed every aspect of Liz Truss's mini-budget. Liz Truss, as of today, looks like she's still Prime Minister, but performing a purely decorative function. The person who's really running things is Jeremy Hunt, who, as I said, is this ex-Remainer establishment figure. And everybody, the entire media, as we speak, are now saying that it's only a matter of time, probably just a few days, before Liz Truss herself goes. Because from everybody's point of view, her credibility is gone, her authority is shattered, she's clearly not in control of the government anymore to to the extent that anybody is it is Jeremy Hunt but also as I said all these shadowy forces that exist behind the scenes so it's only a matter of time now before the Conservative Party the Parliamentary Party moves to replace her probably with Rishi Sunak but it's conceivable it could be Jeremy Hunt himself. So we'll see how it turns out. So it could be Jeremy Hunt. It's more who, remember, lost two leadership elections. He lost against Boris Johnson. He lost against uh, 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 Liz Truss. I still think eventually it's more likely to be Sunak. But the only thing, it seems to me, that's keeping... Trust at the moment in her job is that they haven't yet fully decided which of these two people it's going to be. That's all that's left. So a very British coup. Uh, there's been a big article by Tim Stanley, a rather astute commentator in the Daily Telegraph, who perhaps watches our programmes, <laughs> because if you read it through, it makes all the same points that we've been making, or many of them at least. But it is, it's been a coup and it's succeeding. I mean, it's only a question of time before Liz Truss goes, and we are back to the world which existed before 2016, completely controlled by the British permanent state. You know, the the Brexit 
revolution has been quashed. We might still, in theory, be outside the EU, but for all practical terms, the old power is back and is back in its pomp. And of course, if there's an election and Keir Starmer wins, well, then they'll have got the person that they really want to be in charge. Yeah. I don't have much to add to everything that you said, Alexander. That's some, uh, that's some democracy going on over there in the, in the UK. Um, what's well, Hunt's relationship with Sunak, by the way? I mean, do they get along? Oh, I don't think they're, I don't think, I don't think they're. I don't think they're friends. I think they are basically adversaries, actually. But having said that, they are they are nonetheless adversaries who are on the same side of the political divide. They're rivals. Perhaps it should be said more rivals than adversaries. And you know, I can I can see the two working together. I can see uh, Sunak as prime minister and Hunt remaining chancellor, or Hunt becoming prime minister and Sunak brought back into the cabinet in some capacity. But I mean, I, you know, they may not be friends, they may not be allies, they may not terribly like each other. But ultimately, their outlook is the same. Right. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's move away from the disaster that is uh, the UK. Let's talk briefly about France. Protests over the weekend in France, uh, gas shortages throughout, uh, general strike on the 18th. Yeah. This is turning out to be a disaster for Macron. Yeah, absolutely. It's exactly what we said, by the way. If you remember, we did a program, uh, a brief program a few days ago, in which uh, we discussed how the situation was working out in France. What's happening? And this is very dangerous for Macron, more dangerous than the Yellow Vest protests were, because the Yellow Vest protests, though they had a lot of you know, traction in France, a lot of people were sympathetic to the protests, but they were basically one particular group within French society. The people who lived in the small towns and villages of rural France, France profonde, as it's often called, very upset with the way in which the government in Paris had become remote from them, had become Europeanist, was uninterested in France itself, was distancing itself from France, you know, the, the, the symbols of France, uh, was be becoming, you know, integrated in the global globalist, integrationist, Europeanist system, and was at the same time taking action against their economic interests. What's now happening is that that resentment that anger which existed and still exists amongst that community, that large part of French society in rural France, it's coming together with all sorts of other groups across French society, which are becoming angry as well. So industrial workers, factory workers, people who work in the oil refineries, people who work in the transport system, people also a lot of middle class people who are feeling under extreme economic pressure and a lot of left wing people. I mean, people who support Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who identify themselves with the left. All of these groups are now combining, might only be a temporary combination, but it's focused against the man in the Elysee, against Macron, who is seen not just as out of touch and remote, but more interested in Ukraine, uninterested in addressing the problems of French society, and is taking increasingly aggressive um, steps against French society. He gave an astonishing interview, lasted for a whole hour, in which he took an incredibly confrontational approach towards you know, strikers, refused to acknowledge in any way that you know, any one of his decisions had anything to do with the problems that are now accumulating. And again, as he always does, he was very threatening. And there's talk about the army being used, something the French army will not be pleased about, by the way, and using repression and the, you know, the apparatus of the state to bring these people to heel. In a country like France, when you do that, France, with its revolutionary tradition, you're playing with fire. And I think Macron is. Yeah, but he doesn't have another answer. The only other thing he can do is to roll back 
the sanctions yes. and to stop he supporting went. this Ukraine escalation. He's not going to do that. He won't do it. So the Absolutely. only road left for yeah, the only road left for him is yeah. is using violence to yes. uh, suppress the protesters. And we're just at the beginning of this. I completely agree. You know, the worse things get, the more protests we're going to have, yeah. Absolutely. That's exactly what's going to happen. And by the way, that is true of all Western governments. They're all in the same problem, but they won't get out of this hole that they're digging for themselves. On the contrary, their instinct is to double down and to screw more tightly on the controls over um, over their respective societies. And, you know, in Germany, it's a conformist place. You can get away with it for a time, quite a long time, I suspect. In Greece and Southern Europe, people are very demoralized because of, well, we know the history there and the feeling that things can't change. Britain, we had problems, but we're also a conformist country. France, as its revolutionary tradition, things might get out of control. Now, we'll see. I mean, you know, people, France has also changed. I mean, the France I used to know very well. I mean, by this time, if we're talking about the France of 30, 40, 50 years ago, we would already have had that explosion. Um, but I still feel that we're closer to an explosion in France than we're anywhere else. Yeah. I agree with that. All right. We will wrap it up there. The Durant.locals.com. Go to the Durant shop. 10% off. Use the code good day and look for us on Rockfin. I have the link down below and you can catch our first look videos every Monday on Rockfin. Take care.